in this grace also. Uh, about three or four weeks ago, I was um, sitting in the dark. I was reading through some devotions, and I, I, I just hit this passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And those last four words of verse 7, in this grace also. I couldn't get it out of my mind. I spent the next two or three days just going back to it again and again. The verse goes like this. Just as you excel in everything, in faith, in utterance, knowledge, and in your love for us, see to it that you excel in this grace also. And he's talking about generosity. Well, it, well, I knew that because I'd read 2 Corinthians 8 before, believe it or not. And so I thought, well, I think I know where he's going to go with this. But for some reason, I just felt like I couldn't, I couldn't get past that. I, I felt as if the Lord was pressing that not just phrase, but that virtue onto us. And I wasn't sure whether it was me, whether God was saying, Steve, you already spend a lot of time in knowledge and in utterance, <laughs> talk too much, um, and, and in faith, but, but see to it that you excel in generosity. Or was he talking about us? College church, you're like the church at Corinth. You are known for your intellect and you're known for your eloquence. Everybody around town and around the Wesleyan church thinks of College West as this kind of heady church. And whenever somebody stands in front of College West, they generally, on most days, have it together. Nobody wings it. And you're learning faith four times in the last few years. You've decided to go above and beyond what we thought we could do. And every time God has come through and he's provided exactly what we need. Now, College West, what if you added this grace also, this, this thing called generosity. I thought, I mean, I, I, I'm not quite sure what God really wants us more of here because personally, I already give a lot in college. Wes already gives a ton. I can't think of a church literally in our city that is more giving than this church. And we do it in, I think, beautiful ways. We give to organizations sometimes without them even knowing it. So I've got that going through my mind. Uh, and I thought, what, what does God want more of? Then it occurred to me that what he says is he doesn't want more of anything. What this is not something he wants from us. This is something he wants for us. This is not just the discipline. This is a grace. I want to give you a grace. A grace called generosity. It's possible for you to give lots of things away and still not do so generously. Are you still there? Don't leave. Many do. In fact, we confuse this. We talk about gifts of a lot as being generous gifts. But in fact, if I'm reading this right, it, it has little to nothing to do with the amount 
It has more to do with the spirit in which it is given. It isn't just the act. It's the source of the act that makes someone generous. So even though we've learned, many of us, a long time ago, how to give out of discipline, how to do it faithfully and religiously and sometimes beyond our means, is the Spirit saying to our church this morning, and he is speaking to a church. This is not a letter to an individual. This is a letter to a congregation. Is he saying to college church, I want you to grow in this grace of generosity. Are you okay? It's quiet. You're thinking I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this big ask at the end. <laughs> Here's the beauty of this. I'm going to speak for the next few minutes on generosity, and I'm not going to ask for anything. I'm not going to make an ask at the end. And I'm not going to set you up to give to some other organization. You're not going to scan a QR code, anything, nothing like that. All right, exhale. Are we okay? It starts in this parable, this parable that has given uh, uh, me trouble for a long time. In fact, about three years ago, we were speaking through the parables. I saw this one in Luke 16, and I said, I ain't touching that with a 10-foot pole. And here's why, because the way that the story goes, uh, this manager of a rich guy, uh, he gets fired from his job, and so he decides, well, I got a few days left where I'm still in control of his assets, and he decides what he's going to do is he's going to go out and kind of, you know, stick it to the man. And so he calls people in and says, well, how much do you owe? Guy says 800. He says, cut it in half, 400. Says the next guy, how much you owe? Guy said 1,000. He says, I'll make it 800. So one guy gets a 50% and one guy gets a 20% dis discount. And it ends well. I mean, Jesus speaking for the manager says that the manager comes back and says, wow, that's a good thing. And so I was having a hard time saying, how am I going to teach that to my kids? <laughs> you know, if something goes badly in life, we'll stick it to the man. Uh, find somebody else's resources and leverage those for your advantage and set yourself up. And then when they fire you, whatever happens to him, you got it made. That just didn't feel like something you say in church. starting to think otherwise of it on a couple of bases. One is that that word in verse 4, house. When I do this, he says, they will welcome me into their house. The word there is oikos. It's a root word of a long Greek word, oikonomos, from which we get our word economy. It occurs to me that what Jesus is describing here is not an act, but an economy. It's a whole way of thinking. The second clue uh, comes in verse 8, where uh, Jesus calls the manager a dishonest person but then says he acted shrewdly. And when I look that up, shrewdly um, is a Greek word that means wise, prudent, intelligent, understanding. So when someone acts shrewdly, they understand how things actually work. And so in verse 8, he comes back and says, yeah, the guy was dishonest, but he knows how things work. And it occurs to me that the way to read this parable is not through a lens of moral behavior. You have to read it through a lens of a wisdom behavior. Moral asks, is something right or wrong, which is what's sending some of you off. You're like, well, I mean, the guy ripped off his boss, man, that's wrong. 
Wisdom asks, is something wise or foolish? So the story occurs now in three scenes. There's a rich guy that has a bunch of stuff because in this economy, that's how things work. Most of the stuff goes into the hands of a few. And there is one of the few, a rich guy who owns a lot, and he has hired a manager to oversee his assets. That's working well until it doesn't. One day there comes a rumor that the manager is mishandling the stuff. The word there, wasting, literally means to scatter it. But so far as we know, it's only a rumor. We're never told that it's actually true. And so on the basis of a rumor, the manager gets fired. Calls him in. The rich man's mind is already made up. He says, open the books and let me look at them because you're fired. He didn't say there's going to be an investigation. He said, you're fired. Now let's see the facts. So on the basis of a rumor, the rich has just released the employee from his job. Scene two. The manager says to himself, well, now I'm in a quandary because I'm too lazy to work and and, uh, I'm too proud to beg. So how am I going to make it if I won't work and I won't beg? wait a minute, I got an idea. I've got a couple more days here left with the owner's money. Why don't I use the position I have and use the owner's money to set myself up for the future? So he calls in the first guy, says, what do you owe? Guy says, 800. He says, cut that in half. That's only 400 calls the next guy and says, what do you owe? Guy says, a thousand. Says, make that 800. And he does this because he says, there's coming a day sooner than later when I lose my job and I no longer have assets like I have today. So I'm going to take what I can't keep for long. And I'm going to invest it in something that I can't lose when my job is over. Scene three. The manager or the rich man finds out about this and he calls the manager in and says, what on earth have you done? And when he tells him what he did, you're waiting for the hammer to fall. And that's when the rich guy says, Brilliant. That is brilliant. And then Jesus sort of speaks as a commentary so we don't miss the point. And he says, you see, that's kind of how it is with the children of this world. Uh, They are not always righteous, but they're smart. They know how things work. Whereas the people in my kingdom are quite often righteous but they ain't too smart because they don't know how things work nineteen ninety two during a presidential election Bill Clinton won that presidential election Uh, on the basis of a slogan that had four words. It's the economy stupid. Some of you are too young to remember that. I'm not. I was, I think, two years old at the time. it's, It's the economy stupid. The incumbent president, George H.W. Bush, had just come out of a, of a romp in the Persian Gulf. So his ratings were super high. But then in the course of about 12 months, they started to decline. And the Democrats didn't have much to go on because the election was going to follow a high. 
And so what they did was they invented, Clinton invented a slogan, it's the economy stupid, as a way to say to the public, you can talk about the war if you want, you can talk about education or crime in the streets, but what everybody's caring about right now is the economy. Everybody's struggling because of the economy. The irony of this is that last week, the Republicans borrowed the same phrase to unseat the Democrats. If you live long enough, it all comes around. I said, how is it that a phrase the Democrats invented was just used as a weapon against the Democrats? Both administrations have suggested that the economy is the problem. Both of them have offered different solutions, which the other one only uses in four years to weaponize until there's a power change. And, and we go, is it just me? We go through this dead gum every four years, man. You're just like, really, are we going to do this again? You guys are having the same argument with the same old tired answers. And then it occurred to me that both administration are building answers on the same set of assumptions. And so the problem I'm beginning to wonder is not so much the economy. It's the assumptions that are driving the economy that neither side seems willing to embrace and they will never embrace because they lack the imagination and they lack the nerve to pull it off. No politician would survive changes this sweeping. So all they do is move the deck chairs on the Titanic because they can't find a better solution. As far as I can tell, Five assumptions are driving the economy as I know it. This is the one I grew up in, and I grew up in church. I live this. The first is scarcity. There is only so much of everything. And when you run out, you're out. The second is ownership. The purpose of work is to make a living. Therefore, the living you make is earned, not given. And if it's earned, then it's owned. It's yours. And if it's owned, it's private. You can give it if you want. But if you do, because the law of scarcity is always in play. You will have less and somebody else will have more. If you get more, it will not come in the same form as what you gave away. And so as long as you function on a scarcity ownership mentality, you could receive in kind many benefits for the gifts that you gave and you would miss most of them because you only speak one language when you think about possessions. Third, competition. Because whatever is in supply is in short supply. Different players and different... Um, classes, therefore, compete for the same few things. And when competition gets together with scarcity, it creates this growth mentality that says the only insurance against running out is more. Grow, 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 Everything in scale. Because the more you have, 
the less likely you are to run out. Four, consumption. Acquisition is the way to happiness. People that can purchase a lot are, quote, well off. And people who can't purchase as much aren't as well off. So whatever I have, that's what I need. With respect to the Beatles who sang, all you need is love. All we love is need. And we didn't know it. I'm going to the store today. What do you need? Oh, I don't know. Dude, don't shop. Hunt. If you don't know what you want, why are you going? Five. Control. The system, the laws, the regulations is in the hands of the government or the man, which means it's always somebody outside of me that's in control of my happiness. This turns every election into an act of consumers whereby we delegate to the politicians the power to provide a full and satisfying life. So what appears to be an election is actually consumption. Where citizens are turned into consumers. How are we doing? What do you do when the economy that you grew up in is no longer working? Because I don't think this one is. And I'll be honest with you, it, this hasn't been working for a long time. And my trouble with, I got to come down here. My trouble with, um, well, I worry for some of you because you have been suffering under that economy. And what I see happening is I see in the next few years as a younger generation takes control of the power structures, they will start rewriting laws that redistribute wealth, which is a good thing unless it is done on the same five flawed assumptions. Do you see this? If you keep moving things around on the same five assumptions, you only create other victims. What is needed is not a better economy, but a different one. And since this can't be done on so large a scale, it must be done, I believe, by little communities of grace who just live differently because they see things differently. Which is what led me back to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. It, this, 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 this passage uh, that, that has been used by so many, by me, to talk to people about giving. Give more. Remember, I'm not going to ask for this. I don't want anything from you. I want something for you. That was an amen right back there. <laughs> in this passage, in 2 Corinthians 8, Paul is talking to a series of churches because what's happening is there is a church in Jerusalem which is almost a thousand miles away and they're suffering affliction, persecution. There's been famine. 
they're hardly making it. And this is a mostly Jewish church, and that matters because a thousand miles away is a church of almost all Gentiles. And right now, they're not suffering. Things for them are going pretty well. And so Paul steps into the midst of this this picture, and he's trying to broker something for the people that don't have anything in Jerusalem. You guys, I can't get over this. The Jews don't even want the Gentiles in the church yet. And yet, God is going to use the Gentiles to come over and bless the Jews. This is beautiful. They've never met them. They don't even know them. And yet they've heard that there is a brother, there's a sister a thousand miles away who is living in hard times, and we're not. So we got to do something that can help those people. It's an amazing spirit. So he tells them to take up an offering. And when he does, he'll collect it and he will give all of it. All of it. All of it. Not administration fee. All of it. He will give to the church in Jerusalem. And I start to see in this beautiful picture of Gentiles who once felt like they didn't even belong being used by God to help people um, a thousand miles away, I start to feel this vortex of scarcity and ownership and uh, competition and consumption and control, which just leads to more scarcity and more ownership. I start to see this cycle be undone by generosity. I hear Paul say, do it backwards. The man or the government is not in control. You are in control. You have full agency over what you will do with your disposable income. Those are choices that you make. Yes, inflation is high. It costs more than it did four years ago, but you still have choices. Don't abdicate to some power over you the ability to make a full and satisfying life. That power rests in you, not in somebody outside of you. So take agency to do with the assets you have, whether little or great, and just live differently with them. Rather than control, think freedom. Rather than consumption, think sacrifice. How do I live on less so that other people can have? You know, so I deserve this. You do. You do. Fully. But you still have the power to make decisions with what you deserve. So rather than consume as if another acquisition was going to make it even better, start unleashing some of that onto those who have need. Rather than competition, think of covenant. This person is not my competition for the same scarce resources. They're my brother and my sister to whom I have an obligation. I was telling in the first hour, I had a friend, he was talking about this. He grew up near Holland, which is where I'm from, at least originally. And they're all Dutch there. And so I can speak uh, of Dutch in the most prejudice of terms. They, we are tight. My mother used to say, you're so tight, you squeak. The big thing for us is the money that we didn't spend. 
And so every Christmas, whenever we get somebody a gift and they go, wow, this is amazing. We always go, yeah, I didn't pay that much for it. It sort of, it sort of takes a little of the shine off of the gift, but we're always thinking, you know, that's sort of a double down. It's like, oh my goodness, you got an amazing gift and you didn't pay much. That is brilliant. I've learned in the last three car purchases how to compete with car dealers. Always got an angle. You know this. So I found a system I, probably 20 years ago. I owned cars for about 10 years before they die. Uh, and, and it's worked every time. And so this last time I went in to get a car because I'd had 10, 12 years. It was dying. And I go in and I see the whole thing is a competition. I'm thinking, I know what this guy's doing, man. He knows every angle. I'm watching YouTube videos, you know, oh, watch out for this kind of thing. I go in and, and I'm negotiating and I'm playing two of them against each other. That's part of the game. And finally, I said, well, you know what? You need to decide. Am I going to go here, Indianapolis? You decide. I'm leaving this morning. I'm leaving in 20 minutes. Which way am I going to go? God goes, holy cow, man. Well, he, he lowers the deal. I go up there. I buy the car. And when I'm walking out, I'm looking at the manager and he looks mad. And I'm thinking to myself, that is amazing. It was so good a deal that the managers ticked. That's how you know. Then I have this conversation with this friend of mine up there, and he says, you know, the Dutch are always that way. And I'm like, what's wrong with that? He said, well, you know, I'm thinking if, if, if the car dealer is your... He says, here's what I did. He said, I went into the car dealer, and I said, look, it's important to me that we both make money. I said, you what? He said, we both make money. After all, three years from now, if something happens, I want you to be here. So we got to find a deal that's going to be really good for you and it's going to be just as good for me. They start to negotiate. They find what they think was a price. He turns to the manager and says, now I just want to be sure before I sign, is this a good deal for you? I went, man, what on earth are you on? It's a totally different way of thinking. Instead of thinking of everything as competition, think of it as covenant that you have with other people. He went on to say, if your father had seven kids and you told him one day the good deal you got at the expense of your older sister do you think he'd be happy? Way to go, son. You ripped her off. Instead of competition, think covenant. Instead of ownership, think stewardship. You're renting it. somebody else's and instead of scarcity of course think abundance if your father knows what you have need of before you even ask this is a remarkable way to live can you are you tracking can you see this the only way to break this iron clad economy is with a different way of living. And I think that individuals can't do this alone because if we try it alone in a cutthroat economy, we will always be taken advantage of. If we live as a community like this, then there is safety and, and, and there is help in one another. All right. Uh, what does this mean for you? Well, there's, I'm not asking for anything. There's no QR code, nothing. You just, you just, my prayer this morning, it really was, was that this would be like a time release. You'll take it right now and feel nothing. I can tell by the look on some of your faces, that's exactly what is happening. But, but, but maybe later on, you know, it'll kick in. Something will happen this week or other, 
it'll kick in. And, and my prayer has been, Lord, they might not remember this today. Don't let them forget it. When we have decisions to make. For now, I think the way for us to, uh, to uh, what's the word, confirm this, affirm this, is to pray the same prayer that we pray every month. Only then it's with an offering. But this morning, because there's no offering, um, my hope is that you will, you will say it with a depth of meaning that goes beyond most months. Are you okay? Let's look to the screen. We'll pray it together. Most gracious God, we thank you and praise you for giving us more than enough. Accept the offerings of your people. In your love, remember those who have brought it and those for whom it was given. Follow it with your blessing that these seeds of generosity may bear the fruit of your kingdom in our community and around the world. Amidst the fear of scarcity, make this body a source of your abundance. When we receive open our hands. When others grab, teach us to give. When others hoard, teach us to share. And when we're tempted to worry about tomorrow, remind us you have given us everything we need. By your Holy Spirit, make us cheerfully one with Christ, one with each other, one in ministry to all the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. 